So today we start a new section. We are starting the Jarasan, the chapters. So this comprises three, a little more than three chapters. The end of chapter 70, 71, 72, and 73. So starting with this series, I have now composed summaries for all the chapters in this section. So first we'll get an overview of what we're going to study, and then in the successive weeks we'll get into the details. So here is the summary of the uh, Jarasandha Leela. On one occasion, the doorkeepers escorted a messenger into the assembly hall. The messenger offered prostrated obeisances to Lord Krishna and then standing with joined palms addressed Krishna. O Lord Krishna, Jarasandha has captured 20,000 kings and is holding them prisoner. Please do something for these kings, for they are all your surrendered devotees. Just at that moment, Narada Muni appeared. Lord Sri Krishna and all the members of the assembly stood up and offered obeisances to Narada by bowing their heads. Sage Narada accepted a seat and then Lord Krishna gently questioned him. O Narada, since you travel all over the universe, please inform us what the Pandavas are planning to do now. Narada then praised the Supreme Lord Krishna and replied, my dear Lord, King Yudhisthira desires to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice. And for this, Yudhisthira requires your sanction and presence. Many demigods and illustrious kings will then come just to see you. Understanding that the Yadavas wanted Krishna to defeat Jarasandha, Lord Krishna then asked his wise minister Uddhava to determine which of the two matters at hand, whether the defeat of Jarasandha or the Rajusya sacrifice, should be attended to first. So that was the end of chapter 70 summarized. Now the summary of chapter 71. This is entitled, The Lord Travels to Indraprastha. This chapter relates how Lord Krishna followed Uddhava's advice and went to Indraprastha, where the Pandavas celebrated Krishna's arrival with great festivity. Wise Uddhava, knowing Lord Krishna's inner desire, advised Krishna as follows. My dear Lord, by conquering all directions and then performing the Raju Suya sacrifice, Yudhisthira will fulfill all his purposes, including defeating Jarasandha, protecting all those who have taken shelter of you, and executing the Rajasuya Yajna. Thus, the powerful enemy of the Yadavas, Jarasandha, will be destroyed, and the 20,000 imprisoned kings will be freed. And both of these deeds will glorify you, Krishna. Try to understand, Jarasandha can be killed only by Bhima, and since Jarasandha is very devoted to the Brahmanas, Bhima should disguise himself as a Brahmana, go to Jarasandha and beg a fight from him. Then, in your presence, Krishna, 
<coughs> Bhima will defeat the demon. Narada Muni, the Yadava elders, and Lord Krishna, all of them praised Uddhava's plan. And so Lord Krishna proceeded to mount his chariot and head for Indraprastha, followed by his devoted queens. Soon, Lord Krishna arrived in the city. Hearing of the Lord's arrival, Yudhisthira immediately came out of the city to greet Krishna. Yudhisthira repeatedly embraced Lord Krishna, losing external consciousness in his ecstasy. Then Bhimasena, Arjuna, Nakula, Sahadev, and others each embraced or bowed down to Krishna as was appropriate. After Lord Krishna had properly greeted everyone, Krishna entered the city as a fanfare of many musical instruments played and reverential hymns were chanted. The women of the city scattered flowers down from the rooftops, remarking on the extreme good fortune of all of Krishna's queens. Lord Sri Krishna entered the royal palace and offered respects to Queen Kunti Devi, who embraced her nephew Krishna, while Draupadi and Subhadra offered obeisances to Krishna. Kunti Devi then requested Draupadi to worship Lord Krishna's wives. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Sri Krishna gratified King Yudhisthira by remaining there for some months. And during this stay, Krishna enjoyed strolling here and there. Krishna would drive on chariots with Arjuna, followed by many warriors and soldiers. The next chapter, 72, is entitled the slaying of the demon Jarasandha. This chapter describes how Lord Krishna heard Yudhisthira's request and then arranged for Bhimasena to defeat Jarasandha. One day, King Yudhisthira addressed Lord Krishna as Krishna sat in the royal assembly hall. O oh, my dear Lord, I wish to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice. In this sacrifice, people uninterested in your devotional service will be able to see firsthand the superiority of your devotees and the inferiority of non-devotees. And they will also be able to see your lotus feet. Lord Krishna extolled Yudhisthira's proposition. O oh, King Yudhisthira, your scheme is so excellent that it will also spread your fame throughout the whole universe. Indeed, all living beings should desire that this Rajusiya sacrifice be performed. But, to make this sacrifice possible, however, you must first defeat all the kings on the earth and collect all the necessary paraphernalia. Satisfied with Lord Krishna's words, King Yudhisthira sent his brothers to conquer the various directions. And after they had conquered or won the fealty of the kings in their assigned directions, they brought back abundant wealth to their brother Yudhisthira. However, they informed King Yudhisthira that Jarasandha could not be defeated. As Yudhisthira pondered how he could subdue Jarasandha, Sri Krishna revealed to him the means for doing so, 
following the previous advice of Uddhava, Bhim, Arjun, and Krishna then disguised themselves as Brahmanas and went to the capital city of Jarasandha. And Jarasandha was known as being very devoted to the Brahmin class. The three of them introduced themselves as Brahmanas to King Jarasandha and they flattered him, praising his reputation for hospitality and requested Jarasandha to grant their desire. However, seeing the marks of bowstrings on their limbs, Jarasandha could surmise that these were not warriors, excuse me, that these were warriors, not brahmanas. I'll repeat that. Seeing the marks of bowstrings on their limbs, Jarasandha concluded that they were warriors, not brahmanas. But still, even though fearful, Jarasandha promised to fulfill whatever desire these so-called brahmanas might have. And at that very point, Lord Krishna discarded his disguise and asked Jarasandha to fight him one-to-one -one in combat. But Jarasandha refused. He claimed that Krishna was a coward because Krishna had once fled the battlefield. So Jarasandha also declined to fight Arjuna on the excuse that Arjuna was inferior in age and size. But Jarasandha considered Bhima a most worthy opponent. J thus, Jarasandha handed Bhima a club and Jarasandha took up another himself and they all went outside of the city to begin the fight. After the fight had gone on for some time, it became clear that the two opponents were too equally matched for either to gain victory. At that time, Lord Krishna split a small tree branch in half, showing Bhima thus how to kill Jarasandha. Bhima threw Jarasandha to the ground, stepped on one of his legs, seized the other with his arms, and proceeded to tear him apart from his genitals up to his head. Seeing Jarasandha now killed, Jarasandha's relatives and subjects cried out in lamentation. Lord Krishna then appointed Jarasandha's son as the ruler of the Magadha kingdom and then released the 20,000 kings Jarasandha had in prison. Now we go to the next chapter. Lord Krishna blesses the liberated kings. This chapter relates how Lord Sri Krishna after freeing the kings imprisoned by Jarasandha, mercifully gave them his audience and bestowed royal gifts upon them. When Lord Krishna freed the 20,800 kings Jarasandha had imprisoned, immediately they fell to the ground and paid him respectful obeisances. Then, they stood with joined palms and began praying to Krishna. Seeing their imprisonment as actually an act of mercy by the Lord to smash their false pride, the kings prayed only to be granted whatever would facilitate their perpetual remembrance of Krishna's lotus feet. Lord Krishna assured the kings that their prayer would be fulfilled. Then Krishna instructed them, My dear kings, 
you should worship me by performing Vedic sacrifices and you should protect your subjects in accordance with the principles of religion. Fixing your minds on me, but beget progeny and remain always equipoised in happiness and stress. And thus, at the end of your lives, you will surely attain me. Lord Krishna then saw to it that the kings were all properly bathed and dressed, and Krishna had Jarasandha's son, Sahadev, offer them flower garlands, sandalwood pulp, fine clothing, and other things suitable for kings. After having them adorned with jewels and golden ornaments, Krishna seated them on chariots and sent them off to their respective kingdoms. In accordance with the orders Lord Krishna had given them, they began to carry out their various duties once again. Then, Lord Krishna, Bhima and Arjuna departed for Indraprastha, where they met with King Yudhishthir and related to him everything that had happened. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So there's one section that I didn't finish last week. So it's an addendum to what we learned in the previous weeks regarding Narada's visit to Krishna's palaces where Narada saw Krishna doing something different in every palace. So here are some additional thoughts to tie up that chapter. First is a quote by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's speaking to Sanatan Goswami. Sraddha Shabde Vishvasa Kahe Sudridha Nishchoy Krishna Bhakti Kaile Sarva Karma Kritahoy. Lord Chaitanya told Sanatan, Sraddha is confident, firm faith that simply by rendering transcendental loving service to Krishna, one automatically performs all subsidiary activities. Such faith is favorable to the discharge of pure devotional service. Then, there is a famous quote of Narada Muni, which is found in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And this quote is something that Prabhupada uh, uses many times throughout his books and in his lectures. Yathatorar mula nisechanena tripyanti tatskanda bujo pashaka prano paharachcha yatendriyanam tataiva sabarhanam achuteja. Narada told the Pracheta sons of King Prachini Bharti. By pouring water on the root of a tree, one automatically satisfies the trunk, branches, and twigs. Similarly, by supplying food to the stomach where it nourishes the life air, one satisfies all the senses. So in the same way, by worshiping Krishna, and rendering Krishna service, one automatically satisfies all the demigods. Then another uh, verse that's important is this statement by Krishna in the Uddhava Gita, where Krishna says, Acharyam mang vijaniyan nava manyeta karhichit Namartya Buddha Suyeta Sarva Deva Mayo Guru. 
My dear Udabas, one should know the Acharya as my very self. And one should never disrespect the Acharya in any way. One should not envy the Acharya, thinking the Acharya to be an ordinary man. For the Acharya is the representative of all the demigods. Then we have a powerful statement by Lord Shiva speaking to his wife, Goddess Durga. Aradhananang Sarveshang Vishnur Aradhanang Parang Tasmat Paratarang Devi Tadiyanang Samarchanam O my dear Devi, although the Vedas recommend worship of demigods, the worship of Lord Vishnu is topmost. However, above the worship of Lord Vishnu is the rendering of service to Vaishnavas, devotees, who are related to Lord Vishnu. And this next statement is found in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It is from the Puranas, and it is one of my personal favorite verses. I would consider this in my top 25 of all the verses that I am familiar with, I love this verse by Lord Chaitanya, quoting the Padma Purana. Vyamohaya characharasya jagataste te purana gamas tang tam evahi devatang Paramakam japantu kobalvadi Siddhante purnar eka eva Bhagavan Vishnu samastagama Vyapareshu vivechana Vyatikarang niteshu nishiyate There are many types of Vedic literatures and supplemental Puranas and in each of them particular demigods are spoken of as the chief demigods. And this is just to create an illusion for moving and non-moving living entities. So let them perpetually engage in such imaginations. However, when one analytically studies all these Vedic literatures Collectively, one comes to the conclusion that Lord Krishna is the one and only Supreme Personality of Godhead. Finishing up, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Narada Muni makes a statement about the systematic performance of Bhagavad Dharma in connection with statements that were previously made by the nine Yogendra sons of Lord Rishabhadev. And Rishabhadev was an incarnation of Krishna. So the Nava Yogendra sons uh, was speaking to Maharaj Nimi. So one of the Nava Yogendras, the sage Karabhajana Rishi, explained the four incarnations of the four yugas. And at the end, Yogendra Karabhajana explained the position of Krishna's pure devotee and how such a devotee is absolved of all debts. Devarshi Bhutapta Nirnang Patrinang Nakin Karonayam Rinne Charajan Saravatmanaya Saranam Saranyam Guto Mukundam Parhiritya Kartam Sri Karabhajana replied to King Nimi One who has given up all material duties and taken full shelter at the lotus feet of Mukunda who gives shelter to all Such a devotee is not indebted 
to the demigods, great sages, ordinary living beings, relatives, friends, mankind, or even one's forefathers who have passed away. In Prabhupada's purport to this verse, where I discovered it, Prabhupada gives the following supplemental information. Adhyapanam Brahma Yagya, Pitri Yagya Stutarpanam, Homo Daibo Balir Bhauto, Nir Yagyo Titi Pujanam. By offering oblations with ye, one satisfies the demigods. By studying the Vedas, one performs Brahma Yagya, which satisfies the great sages. Offering oblations of water before one's forefathers is called Pitri Yagya. By offering tribute, one performs Bhuta Yagya. And by properly receiving guests, one performs Nri Yagya. These are the five yagyas that liquidate the five kinds of indebtedness, namely indebtedness to the demigods, great sages, forefathers, living entities, and common men. Therefore, one has to perform these five kinds of yagyas. Now, you may recall, either last week or the week before, my good friend Kishore Harchandani was asking about this topic. So I said something at that time, and here is the exact proof of why I answered Kishore when he asked. So listen to what Prabhupada now conclusively says. I'm dedicating this to my good friend Kishore. Prabhupada says, but when one takes to the Sankirtan Yagya, the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, one does not have to perform any other Yagya. Did everybody hear that? Now it's settled. The judge has spoken. Judge Prabhupada on the Supreme Court of Krishna. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Everyone should commit this to memory. It is the essence of the Krishna consciousness movement. But when one takes to the Sankirtan Yagya, the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, one does not have to perform any other Yagya. Now, although the pure devotee does not follow all the regulated principles of varna and ashram, the pure devotee worships the lotus feet of Krishna. Therefore, the pure devotee naturally has no tendency to commit sin. However, if a devotee accidentally becomes involved in a sinful activity, Krishna purifies the devotee. The pure devotee does not have to undergo the regulated form of atonement. And here is the verse from the 11th canto, which proves what Prabhupada just wrote. Svapada mulang bhajatak priyasya taktanya bhavasya Hari Paresha, Vikarma Yachcho Patating Katanchid, Dhunoti Sarvang Ridisani Vishta. One who has given up everything and taken full shelter at the lotus feet of Hari, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, such a person is very dear to Krishna. And if such a surrendered soul is involved in some sinful activity by some accident, then the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is seated within everyone's heart, removes one's sins without difficulty. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya.